So welcome everybody to the talk on preventing falls with helpful tips. This is a talk that's designed to help um, if you are someone who is, is starting to have trouble with falls or if you're caring for a loved one that may be having that difficulty. And uh, the idea is that we wanna provide you with helpful tips so that you can start to put together an action plan of steps that you can take to try to prevent future falls. Um, I am a member, a longtime member of the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force. So my name is Kim Bell. I'm a physical therapist, as she said during the introduction. I specialize in working with people with dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, and falls. And I have about 10 years of specialized work in uh, geriatric care, which is working with people over 65 in the home health setting. And then I started a private practice in June of 2014 uh, here in San Diego, where I offer care at an office in Encinitas. And I also have a team, we make house calls as needed for people that can't get to the office safely um, around San Diego County. And we only take patients who have dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, or falls. That's one, one or more of those problems is required to become one of our patients. So we are highly specialized physical therapists. And um, what we're gonna talk about today is uh, tips for you and your loved ones to prevent, hopefully prevent future falls or reduce the risk of future falls. So uh, in the past 16 years that I've been living in San Diego, I was the co-chair of the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force for a total of eight years. Now I'm a dedicated member, but I'm no longer the co-chair. And our mission is to reduce falls and their devastating consequences for older adults in San Diego County. We do have a website. Uh, so Vanaya, I'm on the second slide if you're pulling up the PowerPoint. Um, yeah, it was, um, it was a different Kim. So I'm waiting for your original one to come through. So I, yeah, apologies for that. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, we can keep going. Um, I'll just keep you posted on which slide I'm on. So the website for the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force is sandiegofallprevention.org. And we do have some electronic flyers and handouts that she'll send out to you after the talk with um, information about that website and more information about the San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force. It's basically a um, coordination of both public health professionals that work for the county aging and independent services and then also um, private healthcare providers throughout the county in different types of industries that serve older adults. And also uh, care providers that don't necessarily provide healthcare, but may provide other fall prevention related services. So that's where this PowerPoint comes from. It's from the Speakers Bureau of the Fall Prevention Task Force. So the first thing I wanna start off with as far as content is that there's a lot of myths related to falls in older adults. So I'm on the third slide. Um, one myth, one common myth is that muscle strength and flexibility cannot be regained once you start the aging process. And that's just not true. It is true that losing muscle strength and atrophy of muscles, meaning shrinking of your muscles, is part of normal aging, unfortunately. Great, thank you. However, through exercise, you can regain strength and flexibility. One challenge a lot of people have is that they've never had to exercise before in their life, and then all of a sudden they have to start exercising once they get older because their muscles are atrophying and getting weaker, and that can present a challenge for some people to learn new habits and exercise. And so that's why it's, sometimes it's good to work with a professional, like a physical therapist, any general physical therapist can design a muscle strengthening and flexibility program. And even certain fitness professionals that have more training in working with the aging population can help with an appropriate fitness program uh, to, to regain muscle strength and flexibility that may be reduced with normal aging. The second myth is that if people stay home, they can avoid falling. So one common thing that we see 
you know, when mom or dad starts to fall is that their children, their adult children will say, well, then just don't go out, you know, just I'll have your groceries delivered. You can stop going golfing and then you won't fall anymore. Well, the statistics from San Diego County trauma centers and actually uh, across the board at different trauma centers show that most falls in older adults occur from slipping or tripping on a level surface inside their own home. So by far, most falls happen in the home, in your own home, on a level surface from slipping or tripping. And so it is a myth that if you choose to stay home, that in itself will uh, prevent you from falling. So um, we don't want to necessarily just tell people to stop going out and stay home if they're starting to have problems with falls. We need to take some other actions that we're gonna talk about with our helpful tips. The third myth about falls is that falling is a normal part of aging. And that's not necessarily true. Although falls do increase with age statistically, we certainly know of plenty of older people who have not fallen. And so it's not, although statistically falls are more likely to happen as you get older, it's not inevitable that you're, that everyone across the board is gonna start falling just from normal aging, okay? So we wanna dispel that myth. And Vinaya, please uh, to the next slide, thank you. So statistically, about one in four older adults are reporting a fall once a year. Now this statistic is from health information surveys. So this is like health um, researchers call a random sample of people over 65 and interview them on the phone about their health. This and one out of four of those people in the health information survey reported that they had fallen within the last year. This does not necessarily mean that they all sought out health care. So not everybody that falls is going to end up presenting to a doctor for some kind of care. Of course, sometimes people need to go to the emergency room. Sometimes they need to call 911. Sometimes they go to urgent care if they have like a skin tear or a scrape or a bump or a bruise. Maybe they won't go to the hospital, but they'll go to urgent care. Sometimes people go to their regular doctor. And then a lot of times people just try to hide it. They don't tell anybody that they fell. They don't tell their family. They don't tell their doctors. They don't seek any medical care. But this survey attempts to capture all of those possible outcomes because it's not measured from a health facility. It's actually measured by calling older adults on the phone and interviewing them about their health for a survey. It's called a health information survey. And then one thing that's really important is that if an older adult has had a fall, then they are at a higher risk of falling again as compared to their peers who have not fallen. In fact, uh, statistically, uh, we know that about 50% of people who fall will fall again within six months. And that's why we want to take action to reduce the risk of falling in the future, if possible, with action steps. Next slide. So we're gonna go over four general categories of action steps that you can take uh, to prevent falls. And I wanna be clear that there's no absolute formula to prevent falls that works for every single person. This has to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the individual situation. And the goal here is to reduce the risk of falling, meaning reduce the likelihood of a future fall. But of course, realistically, any of us can fall at any time. I mean, even if we're just walking outside, you know, we could trip on a curb or an uneven sidewalk or something like that. So, you know, anyone of any age can fall at any time. There's no absolute way to prevent falls across the board 100%. But what we want to look at is reducing the likelihood of falls or reducing the risk statistically. And what we know is the more action steps we take to try to prevent falls, the research has shown that it has an exponential impact on the statistical probability of a future fall, meaning it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of steps we take to reduce the risk of falls and the likelihood that we'll fall. It's actually an exponential 
reduction in the likelihood that we'll fall, the more steps we take to uh, prevent future falls. So I would encourage you as you're listening to consider these four areas of potential action and see if you can pick up on some helpful tips that might apply to your situation. The first thing is speaking up. The second thing is keep moving. The third area is get your eyes checked. And then the fourth area is make your home safer. So for the rest of the presentation, we're gonna spend time going through each of these four action areas and offer helpful tips in each of these area, areas that may apply to your situation. So the first area regarding speaking up, this specifically has to do with working with your doctor or your other healthcare providers. We know that chronic health conditions and certain medications predispose people to falls. So I want you to just pause for a second and think about possible medication side effect that could cause someone to fall. So some of the things you might think of are muscle weakness. Some medications cause dizziness, blurry vision, drowsiness, muscle weakness, things like that. Those can all contribute to falls. And then chronic health conditions can contribute to falls. So again, we'll pause for a moment for you to think of a chronic health condition that might contribute to the risk of falling. Some examples are like arthritis. So if someone has a lot of pain in their knee or their hip and they're limping, that could contribute to a fall. Parkinson's, stroke, all neurological, all neurological conditions can contribute to balance problems and falls. Of course, dizziness and vertigo. Um, even medical conditions like blood pressure that's too high or too low can cause dizziness and contribute to falls, especially if you get up quickly. Diabetes that's not well managed, for example, and someone that's having low blood sugar episodes could get lightheaded and fall. So regarding the reduction in fall risk related to chronic health conditions and medications, I have some suggested action steps on the next slide. You want to partner with your primary care physician, which we also call your GP, your general practitioner. Now this could be a doctor, this could be a nurse practitioner, or this could be a physician's assistant. Any of those three types of providers might be your GP, your general practitioner, or your PCP, your primary care provider. Whoever that is, you wanna make sure that you know what medical conditions you've been diagnosed with and how you're supposed to manage them. You also wanna make sure that all the medications you're taking are the correct dosage. Sometimes if you've lost more than 10% of your body weight, your medication dosage may need to be changed for certain drugs. Sometimes those are based on body weight. So for example, if someone goes in the hospital, like a friend of mine just went in the hospital recently over a period of time and lost 30 pounds. Well, some of those medications that he is on may need to be changed because the body weight changed. So you wanna stay on top of um, working with your primary care provider to make sure your medications are all necessary and they're all the correct dosage. And if you think you're having side effects, make sure you discuss that with the prescribing provider to reduce the risk of falling. You also want to make sure to get checked for drug interactions and then certain medications you cannot drink alcohol with them. And so you want to make sure to read the label or the printout of information that you get when you receive your medications from the pharmacy, read any uh, warnings or cautions that come with that. Some of them will say, don't take with alcohol and that can help reduce your risk of falling. Okay, let's look at the next slide. So here's some additional questions to ask your primary care provider. Now keep in mind when you go in for your visit, your doctor has a certain amount of time for you and they have a list of questions they have to actually ask to you that are required by your insurance company, such as, 
Did you get a mammogram? Did you get a vaccine? Did you get your flu shot, right? So they have a list of questions that they have to ask you. So you need to be prepared when it's your turn to talk that you have your questions ready to ask them. And you can actually schedule an annual wellness visit and discuss these questions about preventing falls if you're concerned about balance or fall risk because you've been feeling off balance or you've had falls, one or more falls. And you can also just schedule an appointment outside of the cycle of your annual physical or annual wellness visit just specifically to address your concerns about falls. And you would say, you know, I had a fall or I'm afraid of falling. And that's why I want to come in and talk to the doctor about this specific problem. So here are some suggested questions you can ask your primary care provider. Can any of my medications contribute to falling? You can also have them look over your supplements because some um, over-the-counter supplements and over-the-counter medications your doctor may not even realize you're taking. And some of them do have side effects that can contribute to falls. Um, you can ask about your current health conditions if they want to refer you to say, I'm on number two here on the slide to uh, get your neurological status evaluated, your cardiac status, your vision, your mental health, even, it's interesting, even depression has been shown to increase the risk of falling. So sometimes mental health intervention, if someone is depressed, can uh, reduce the risk of falling. And you can ask your doctor for appropriate referrals to specialists if you have an area of your health that needs more close assessment or management. You can ask, I'm on number three here on the slide, if you would benefit from receiving a referral to physical therapy, which helps with you know, getting out of bed, getting up out of a chair, walking, climbing stairs, going up ramps, inclines, up and down ramps, inclines and stairs, getting in and out of the car, things like that. Maybe you need a referral to occupational therapy, which are therapists that specialize in helping with showering, toileting, uh, dressing, um, cooking, things, normal activities of daily living that might be presenting a challenge if you're off balance or afraid of falling. You can also ask your doctor if you should be taking any additional supplements. Um, like for example, vegans tend to have low vitamin B12 and low iron because of their diet. And those two um, areas, if they're low, when you get your blood work done, that can cause dizziness and contribute to falls. So I'm on number four here. Sometimes based on your blood work, uh, your, your labs, maybe your doctor will recommend for you to start taking some additional supplements that you're not taking. And then you also want to talk to your doctor about what type of exercise might be appropriate for you. We want to look at exercise that works on strength, flexibility, balance, and endurance for the best um, results to reduce falls. And if your doctor's not sure what exercise is good for you, they can refer you to physical therapy or to a fitness professional who can work with you on an exercise program. And will you please advance this slide, Benaya? Thank you. And during your annual wellness visit with your doctor, your insurance does require them to ask you a couple questions. This is through Medicare. Um, some of the questions are, have you fallen in the past year? They should typically be asking you that at your annual physical or your annual wellness visit. They should typically be asking you if you feel unsteady when you're standing or walking, and then if you're worried about falling. And if the answer is yes to any one or more of these questions, then an intervention may be appropriate to reduce the risk of falling. So we just talked about speaking up when you're working with your primary care provider, asking about your medications, asking about supplements, asking about appropriate referrals to specialists, appropriate referrals to therapists, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, and asking what kind of exercise you might need to do. That's all the ways that you can speak up and bring this topic up with your primary care provider because they have so much on their mind it may not be top of their mind unless you bring it up as an issue that you would like to address. Now, the second major area of action 
is regarding keep moving. So one thing we know is that when people retire, they tend to fall into a sedentary lifestyle. Easy to do because they don't have any uh, commitments and things they need to do every day. So what I like to say about that is if you don't fill your schedule with your exercise routine, you're going to end up filling it with doctor's appointments. So it's really important that you figure out what kind of physical activity you can do safely uh, that works for your body and whatever health conditions you might have and make a commitment to it. So whatever works for you, but you want to avoid physical inactivity in retirement. And then uh, the other problem for people to keep moving is if they're afraid of falling, they tend to stop doing things like stay home, stop exercising, things like that. And the problem with that is that just accelerates the uh, loss of muscle strength and the um, atrophy of muscles that can occur with normal aging. If you are physically inactive and um, if you're afraid of falling. So now we'll go to the, uh, the slide number 11, Benaya, which is the footwear. So to stay active, one very important component of keeping moving, which is the second area of action that we're talking about today, is making sure you have the right shoes. Okay, so a lot of people love flip-flops. If you want to get flip-flops that securely fasten to your feet with a heel strap that like either has elastic or Velcro, flip-flops can be okay because they have a non-skid, typically have a non-skid sole. But flip-flops that don't have a heel strap, so they don't securely fasten to your foot, are not recommended. Those do increase the risk of falling. Um, so when we look at footwear, we don't want shoes that have a slick bottom. We don't want high heels. For men with the dress shoes, like if you're getting dressed up to go out to the theater or the opera, men's dress shoes tend to be slick on the bottom. Women's dress shoes tend to be slick on the bottom. And so those are not ideal for preventing falls. I've actually met a lot of retirees who have fallen in the parking lot or parking garage of a theater or an opera or a concert uh, from wearing footwear that just slipped right there on the concrete and they landed on the ground. Uh, not, not a good situation. And then the middle image here shows a shoe that is too heavy and the sole is too thick so you can't feel the ground. So you wanna be able to feel the ground through the sole, the firmness of the ground, which is called the ground reaction force so that you can balance. But you also um, want the shoe to have a thin non-skid sole and to securely fasten to the foot. So it shouldn't be able to slip on or slip off. Okay, so the option here all the way to the right is ideal because the, the, the shoe is not too heavy, the sole is thin and non-skid, preventing slips, and also allowing the person to feel the firmness of the ground through the sole of the foot. And then um, it securely fastens around the heel, which is great. Um, so choosing the proper footwear is important to staying active. The next thing is to know that even activities around the house, like cleaning, gardening, things like that count as uh, physical activity. So I had a lady one time, I gave a fall prevention talk at the Bonita Library uh, about 10 years ago or so. And a woman raised her hand. She said, I clean my whole house from top to bottom almost every day. Does that count as exercise? And I said, you betcha, it sure does. I don't know about you, but after I clean my whole house, I'm tired. So absolutely, gardening, housekeeping, cooking, all these activities that anytime you're up off the couch and you're moving around, that counts as physical activity, which is great. And what you can do is pace yourself throughout the day so that you do something active, then you give yourself a rest break, however long it needs to be of relaxing, sitting, maybe listening to music, watching a TV show, take a break to recover from the activity and then do the next activity um, so that you're not um, overdoing it, but you're also not just sitting for hours and hours on end uh, watching back-to-back -back shows and you're, while your muscles are withering away and getting weaker. 
So certain people like to exercise in groups, like you see this group out here walking together. Sometimes people like to do group exercise. Some people like to um, do fitness classes. Some people like to work out with a personal trainer. Some people like to uh, stay home and watch the Feeling Fit Club on television in San Diego. And they can do exercises in a, sitting in a chair or standing in the privacy of their own home while watching the Feeling Fit Club, which is a free exercise program by San Diego County. So it depends whether you like to do things by yourself, with a partner, in a group, whatever works for you. The, one of the most important things we've found about exercise is you have to enjoy it. Because if you don't enjoy it, eventually you're gonna start skipping it. And that's when you start to kind of fall off the wagon of staying moving. So uh, one thing we do find, especially in physical therapy, is the more active people are, typically the less pain that they have. So um, when people lose strength and they get out of shape, that's frequently when their pain actually gets worse because their muscles aren't as strong. So whatever you need to do to keep moving, I would encourage you to make sure you have the right footwear, plan your activities for the day to pace out physical activity with rest breaks, and then find some type of exercise that you enjoy that you can make a commitment to doing. I want to mention physical therapy here because sometimes people are afraid to get moving because they don't know what is safe for them. For example, someone just had a heart surgery. Somebody has a hip replacement. Somebody has back pain. Somebody has arthritis in their foot or diabetic neuropathy in their feet. So sometimes if people have a medical or surgical history, they're not sure. And maybe they've never exercised before in their life because they never had to. They're just not sure what is safe or appropriate for them given their medical conditions or surgical history. And that's where a referral to physical therapy is very helpful. So if you want your insurance to pay for your physical therapy, you, you have to get a referral from your doctor in order for insurance to pay for physical therapy. And any physical therapist can help you design an exercise program that includes strength, flexibility, balance, and endurance, which is appropriate to reduce the risk of falling. Um, in any physical therapist should be able to do that for you. That's what we do. That's our bread and butter and what we're trained to do is to get people moving, to improve the way you move, even if you have medical issues or a surgical problem or other ongoing health problems. So you can receive physical therapy at a clinic. You can go to a hospital or a health center where they have physical therapy there. You can go to a freestanding building that's like called a private practice where you can receive outpatient physical therapy at any of those type of locations. You can also, if you end up in the hospital for some reason typically or a rehab center, you'll typically receive physical therapy while you're in the hospital. But I'm talking about when you're back at home, when you're at your house, where can you receive physical therapy? Well, you can go to a hospital outpatient rehab. You can go to a freestanding building that's not part of a hospital called a private practice. You can also receive physical therapy in your home, which is what this picture is. And that can be done under uh, Medicare Part A if you're homebound and you can't get, get out to do physical therapy has to be referred by your doctor to do that. And you can also do physical therapy in your home through Medicare Part B, which is the outpatient benefit. There are a lot of companies popping up. A lot of my friends are starting these kind of companies where they're providing outpatient physical therapy through Medicare Part B, but for your convenience, they're providing it in your home. So you don't have to leave the house, even if you're capable of leaving the house to receive uh, outpatient physical therapy. There's a lot of people doing this now in the home. And then you can also pay out of pocket for physical therapy if you would like to do that. California has direct access laws which allow you to go directly to a physical therapist and receive up to 12 visits um, without a doctor's referral if you wanna skip the whole referral process and just go straight to uh, pay for your services without a referral. 
I want to mention in this section about vestibular physical therapy. Vestibular physical therapy is what I do and my team offers. And this is specialized physical therapy for people with dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, and falls. So if you have already gone to physical therapy and you've received general physical therapy, you know, exercises for strengthening your muscles, stretching, balance training, walking training, things like that. If you're still having a balance problem and you're getting discouraged, I want to encourage you here that potentially what you need is a vestibular physical therapist because we are more specialized in training for balance problems and preventing falls. And we look at the neurological component of these things, including what might be causing dizziness from the brain or the inner ear or the neck, things like that. So we're looking uh, a little deeper at the root cause of balance problems than general physical therapists are trained to do. So these are specialists within the field of physical therapy. You could either go to them first if you know you have dizziness or vertigo or balance problems, or you could go to them as plan B after you've already done general physical therapy if that did not resolve your balance problem or your falling problem. So how can you find, or uh, Benai, we go to the next slide, please. I wanna uh, encourage you that the reason vestibular physical therapy is helpful is because we look at that root cause of symptoms. So we're looking at, is this balance problem related to one of your medications? Is this balance problem related to your inner ear problem that maybe has been overlooked by other people? Is this balance problem related to your vision, related to your brain, related to your neck? There's all different things that vestibular physical therapists are gonna consider because they have more training than general physical therapists. And they're gonna actually, uh, we go to the next slide, please. They're actually gonna put their hands on you and do an exam. So slide 17 shows an example of, so, uh, oh, we back up one and we skipped one, thanks. So right here is an example of a type of a test that a vestibular physical therapist might do on you where they actually put their hands on you and check the functioning of your eye reflexes related to balance called your vestibulo-ocular reflex. This is just one example of the type of physical testing a vestibular physical therapist might do on you. And it's unique in healthcare because they don't rely on only, you know, MRIs and x-rays and blood work, which trust me, MRIs are great. X-rays are great. Blood work is great. But for a lot of people, nothing shows up on those tests and then no one knows what to tell you as far as why you're off balance. So sometimes a hands-on physical exam, like what a vestibular physical therapist can do for you is what is needed, if, especially if no one can figure out why you're falling or why you're off balance. So the question is, how do you find this type of specialized vestibular physical therapist? And the next slide will help us with that. So you can look online to find a vestibular healthcare provider on a website called vestibular.org. And this is a nonprofit association that advocates for patients with dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, and falls. They keep a healthcare provider directory on their website, which you can find if you go there, vestibular.org. Scroll down to the section that says find a clinician or find a provider or healthcare provider directory. Look for something like that and then type in your your zip code and how far you're willing to travel, you know, up to 20 miles, up to 50 miles, and it'll pop up for you. Anyone in that geography who has registered on this website uh, as, a, as a provider. Now, I will tell you that not everybody that does vestibular care is listed on there because you have to pay annual dues to be part of this organization, but it's a good starting point. Your doctor could also recommend a vestibular physical therapist if they know about this type of option for care. So there are people who do this type of care that are not on this directory. 
um, but this is a good starting point. And then also um, they don't have any uh, checks or balances to assess the skill level of people who sign up to be part of this directory. And so I would encourage you, if you do find someone on an online directory like this, definitely do your homework and research their online reviews from other patients because uh, it doesn't mean they're good just because they're listed on here. You should still do your homework and research them before you decide to see them. Okay, so now we're gonna move on from the keep moving section to the get your eyes checked section. So one problem, there's, there's really th three things that happen with the vision. Um, we have normal aging of the, of the eyes. We have um, pathology of the eyes. So we're talking about glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, cataracts, things like that. So we have actual pathology of the eyes or like eye disease that needs to be treated by a doctor. We have um, normal aging of the eyes, which affects everybody across the board, such as uh, redu reduced depth perception with normal aging. Everybody with normal aging is going to need more light to see what they used to see with less light. Um, and then we also have medication side effects that affect the vision. So the key thing here is to get your eyes checked once a year. Typically, um, we'll go to the next slide there, Vinaya. You want to get your eyes checked once a year. Typically, that's going to be with an optometrist. And they're gonna make sure that you have the most up-to-date glasses for yourself. Um, you also wanna be aware and be cautious with progressive lenses, bifocals and trifocals because they do contribute to falls when people are stepping up curbs, steps or inclines because they might look down through the reading portion of the lens. So if you have a split screen lens, like a bifocal, a trifocal, or a progressive, you want to make sure to tilt your head down to look through the upper part of the lens to navigate curbs, stairs, and inclines. Otherwise, you could catch your foot because you're, if you're looking down through the reading lens, uh, this happened to my grandma, and she fell on the curb outside of CVS because she was wearing her progressives, and she just looked down through the reading portion of the lens that plus the normal change with aging of having a reduced depth perception and she just totally misstepped on the curb and landed and scraped her knees. So you wanna be careful with those split screen glasses. Sometimes um, it's better to have a separate set of reading glasses that you just kind of hang around your neck um, if you can't safely navigate out in the community with the bifocals, trifocals or progressive lenses. But some people have no problem with that. And then if you have an eye disease, uh, like the ones I listed, a pathology, you wanna make sure you're keeping up with your ophthalmologist and doing whatever they recommend to manage those eye diseases, whether that's medication, eye drops, surgery, whatever they suggest, you wanna just maximize your vision because uh, we wanna make sure that you're reducing your risk of falling by staying on top of the vision changes that can occur with eye diseases and with normal aging. And then the final section of our talk as far as action steps is making sure your home is safe. So again, you see in the upper left corner here, that room looks really dark. And what I just mentioned is how older people need more light to see things the same way they used to see fine in the darker and dimmer lighting. So typically people have to add more wattage to their light bulbs or they have to um, open more windows, but then the normal aging of the eye can also be more sensitive to glare. So you wanna be careful um, if you are doing the windows, um, not to have countertops and surfaces in your house that are gonna reflect a lot of glare. So you wanna be able to increase the lighting without increasing the glare, ideally, for um, making your environment as safe as possible. And then, down here on the bottom left of the screen, we see that puddle there. Um, slipping and falling on a level surface, as I mentioned, is the most common way that older people fall. So if you see a hazard like that, you just wanna make sure you clean it up. Don't just leave it on the floor. And this can even apply, um, I've had a handful of patients that had a housekeeper come over and um, 
you know, mop the floor or wax the floor. And then the floor was slippery because the housekeeper had just worked on it and they slipped and fell. So I just want to be careful about uh, water, uh, wax, mopping, spills, things like that, that could increase the risk of falling. And then um, in the middle here where we see all this clutter, one thing that's really common, especially as people downsize from their family home into a condo or an apartment or a senior living community or a smaller house is they tend to want to keep all their stuff. So a lot of times the walkways will get really cluttered. So it is important to, um, you know, put in organizational systems like shelving, things like that to organize stuff when you downsize into a smaller living setup. And then also uh, you may have to get rid of some of your furniture, unfortunately. I know it's hard to part with everything, but you don't want your walkways to be cluttered and um, you don't wanna have to turn sideways to shimmy through the room. So you wanna be able to walk through the rooms in your place where you live facing forward at a normal pace without having to turn sideways and scoot between clutter. So that's really important to make sure the walkways are clear. And then of course, people can trip on things in the walkway. Like you see an example here of someone tripping on a throw rug. That's extremely common. I had a patient the other day who said she tripped on the electrical cord when her housekeeper was there vacuuming the house. She didn't even realize the electrical cord was across the room and she just walked right across and she tripped right on the cord and, and fell. So, um, you know, even temporary obstacles, like when someone's in your home doing work, beware, things could be in the walkway. With regards to throw rugs, that's a big cause of falls. So we wanna look at either getting rid of the rug if it's not necessary, or getting a rug with a non-skid um, bottom so it doesn't slip around. You can also tape it down with double-sided tape, or you can put um, like a non-skid piece of material under the rug to prevent it from sliding around. So those are just some, some options. You wanna be aware of electrical cords and dog toys, things like that in the walkway that can cause people to trip. And on the next slide, you'll see, um, and, and hit advance it one more time, please, so the checklist pops up. There we go. So you see here the home safety checklist. I actually sent an electronic version of this to UCSD. So they'll send this out to you um, as a follow-up to this talk. This is from the Fall Prevention Task Force, and it's a home safety checklist that kind of goes room by room, listing things you can do to reduce the risk of falling by making your environment more safe. On the next slide, it shows us some examples of inexpensive equipment you might choose to purchase to make your home more safe. So one of the biggest places that people fall is in the bathroom. And of course that makes sense because they're slippery, it's wet, they might have bare feet, they might have shampoo that got on the, on the floor or on the bottom of the shower, making things more slick. So making changes to the environment in the bathroom is very common. Some inexpensive changes are installing grab bars. They even have grab bars now uh, that are called decorative grab bars that actually look like towel racks or look like toilet paper holders. And no one would even know that it's actually a grab bar that can hold your body weight, except for you, because it looks decorative and it's very incognito. But the difference is these are bolted into the studs with long screws, as opposed to a traditional tow towel rack, which is just nailed into the wall with like a one inch screw. And if you pull on a regular towel rack, it's gonna fall right out of the wall and you're gonna fall down. But these um, decorative grab bars or grab bars that look like towel racks or toilet paper holders are bolted in with usually six inch screws into the studs so they can actually weight bear and you can hold on to them while you're getting on and off the toilet or stepping in and out of the shower or the tub and they're safe for weight bearing. So there's a lot of options now with grab bars. 
Um, and these actually are considered in a lot of homes to be an upgrade. So you don't have to worry about reducing the value of your home by making it uh, appropriate for normal aging. A lot of people are looking for that now because they wanna age in place and they want things to be in place um, as they get older. And then if you sit down in the shower, which is what the bottom left corner shows you an example of a tub bench. There's also shower chairs that are smaller than this. Um, if you sit down in the shower on something like this, then you need to get a handheld shower hose, which is shown in the upper right corner so that you can control the flow of water on yourself while you're sitting. Um, some people will need to get things like this reacher that's shown in the upper left. Some people use an assistive device for walking like a cane or a walker. If you feel like you need some kind of a device to walk like a cane or a walker, because you've been reaching out, kind of grabbing onto people or grabbing onto furniture, or you're terrified to walk across an empty parking lot with nothing to hold on to, then uh, you might need a cane or a walker. And um, you can work with a general, any general physical therapist should be able to recommend the correct appropriate device for you, help you get it, fit it to your height and teach you how to use it. And then a lot of people are getting these um, buttons in place, the kind of I've fallen and I can't get up button, which you see here in the bottom right corner. There's a lot of different companies that offer this type of service. Typically, last I checked, the cost is somewhere like around $50 a month for subscribing to this where they have, you press the button and they have a, a live response that can activate 911 for you if you can't get up and you've had a fall. It is important to figure out if you fall, worst case scenario, how will you call for help? And so this is one option of how you can call for help to get one of these buttons in place. Uh, you do need to find out if they work out in the community. Some of them work with satellite, GPS, and some of them are only working with a, like a radio receiver in the home. So you need to find out what the um, total area that these emergency response buttons cover, and then the price, um, and then what who they'll call or what they'll do if you set this up. In addition to these type of emergency response um, services, it's also good to have a lockbox you can buy a lockbox at like Lowe's or Home Depot, and um, you wanna put a key to your, your door in the lockbox, and you can give that code to the fire chief in your local area, or you can give that lockbox code to your emergency response uh, company, because if the 911 is activated and the fire department and police show up at your house to get you because you fell, um, you don't want them to have to break your door down or break in through a back window, of course, because that's going to be expensive to fix. So you want to have a lockbox um, somewhere on your property that you can let them know about and you can give them the code and then they can open the lockbox and then they can get into your house without breaking down the door or breaking a window. Um, Okay, next slide. I wanna make sure you know about some community programs that we have here in San Diego that are free related to fall prevention. So this is on slide 24, there we go. So we have, um, if you go to this website, healthierlivingsd.org, we have a list of the free evidence-based community programs that are available to help you reduce the risk of falling. For example, we have um, healthier living with chronic pain. We have healthier living with diabetes and we have healthier living with chronic health conditions. So these are three different evidence-based programs where you work with a health coach to learn how to take better care of yourself so that you can reduce your risk of falling. Cause a lot of doctors don't have time to go over with you all the details of how to manage all your health conditions. So these are classes where you can learn how to manage your health better. We also have free exercise classes around San Diego. This is a picture on the right here of the Feeling Fit Club, which I mentioned to you. It does air on uh, local access cable around San Diego, I think uh, two or three times a day, Monday through Friday. And then if you call the county, you can get them to mail you some DVDs and an exercise band so you can do the Feeling Fit Club at home. We do also have some sites around the county where we have group classes for Feeling Fit Club uh, at some senior centers and other community centers. And then we do have some Tai Chi, uh, free Tai Chi classes around the county as well. So 
we have exercise programs and we have um, health and wellness coaching programs available to help you uh, with taking care of yourself. And those are free. And I did send flyers to, for those programs to UCSD. So they'll be sending those out to you after the talk. Just to review on the next slide here, it shows us again, those four action areas that we talked about to reduce the risk of falling. The first one is to speak up when you're talking to your doctor about your chronic health conditions and your medications to keep moving, picking the right footwear, choosing a, an active lifestyle, having an exercise program that works for you. If you can't do that on your own, seeking physical therapy, either general physical therapy, or if you're dizzy or have vertigo or have uh, not improve with general physical therapy, you can go to a vestibular physical therapist. Getting your eyes checked, typically that's by the optometrist. And if you have an eye disease, maybe also the ophthalmologist. And then making your home safer by checking the rooms in your house for fall hazards and potentially layering in some new equipment uh, that you might need to make your home safer. So those are the areas of action that we talked about today and I offered helpful tips in each area. On the next slide, you can see the thumbnail for the three UCSD Stein public lectures I've given. Those are all, these are all available on YouTube and on UCTV's website. The one all the way to the right here is specifically on taking steps to prevent falls. Gosh, that was seven years ago that I gave that talk. So it's probably still pretty close to up to date, but maybe some of the statistics are outdated now. And then the one in the middle here, I wanna to mention to you, Dizziness and Vertigo Research on Aging Part One from 2017. That's the most popular lecture I've given at UCSD that has over 3 million views on YouTube right now. So that's a great uh, lecture. It's a panel of healthcare providers that I hosted discussing different aspects of dizziness and vertigo with normal aging. So I encourage you to check those out if you want more information from me. And then on the next slide, um, I have my website here, which is betterbalanceinlife.com. So um, there we go. So betterbalanceinlife.com, you can go on there, you can uh, read. I have over 100 blog articles on there on different aspects of dizziness, vertigo, balance problems and falls. And so you can check that out um, for more information. I have, oh, I have a press page on there where I have a lot of webinars that I've given just like this for other organizations and videos, all kinds of resources on my website for more learning. And then on the next slide, it has the contact information for the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force. So you can call them if you want more information. You can go on the website, sandiegofallprevention.org. And then if you wanna find out more about the healthier living programs like Tai Chi, Feeling Fit, the healthier living with these chronic health conditions I mentioned, pain, diabetes, and any other chronic health condition. If you wanna learn more about that or get some free resources from the county related to fall prevention, you can contact them with this information. So now I know um, we started a few minutes late and now we're ending at 1.03. I, I am available to stay on to answer any questions for a few more minutes if anyone has any questions for me. Thank you all for your attention. Benaya, do you see any questions popping up? I'm checking I the chat and no, um, okay. I don't see any, but thank you so much for your presentation. Um, this was so useful. Good, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you all for your time and I hope you stay dry out there with this weather. Have a wonderful afternoon.